Welcome to the Extra Podcast, a production of Northview Community Church in Abbotsford, British Columbia. Your hosts, Jeff, Ezra, and Thalia, will be discussing the Bible, relevant issues, and current events each week. At Northview, we love to study God's Word and discuss how it applies to our lives, but we try not to take ourselves too seriously. So feel free to laugh with us and at us as we try to challenge and encourage you in your faith. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Extra Podcast. My name is Thalia, one of the pastors on staff, and I'm sitting with Josh, our producer. Hello. Josh Amazonas, best name in the house. (laughs) (laughs) And we don't have Jeff and Ezra here. Where are they, Josh? Ooh, they're at uh, so somewhere I would like to be very much, but Where some is that? sort of conference. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So last week we had to scrounge around and find Jonathan, and this week we had to scrounge a little farther and find Greg. So welcome here, Greg. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for having Mercy on the podcast. Hey, uh, happy to help the extra podcast in any way. <laughs> That's good. So question of the day. High school bands. What high school bands did you listen to? Oh, yeah. Throw yourself under the bus. Yeah. Um, high school bands. Well, like my era would have been like Green Day. Mm. Um, gosh, like I remember like middle school was kind of peak, like boy band pop, like the Britney Spears and sync. Like that was Mm -hmm. very popular. Uh, I probably uh, wasn't a huge fan of, of, those artists in particular, but just give you a feel for what was going on. Um, probably the band I that I most remember from high school is uh, they used to be called Riven. No, nope. and then they became Broken Under One. Okay, <laughs> and this is Jonathan Giesbrecht's band nice. from high school. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, they won a few Battle of the Bands okay. at MEI, and uh, one of the Battle of the Bands that they won, they got to record an album, and I saw them at the MCC fair. Ooh, incredible! Uh, one year. <laughs> Uh, big. That's the high life. Jonathan with long hair and rocking really? out and screaming and dancing and bit of a they, they had a bit of a screamo feel at times. Okay, but not no. That's not that's not fair to screamo. Are they on Spotify? That's what I want to know. Oh, I actually don't think they are. But I uh, I definitely have some broken under one albums that's in my in my album jar. My my last intern project here is going to be making uh t-shirts <laughs> that's yes. a good idea yeah yeah josh what bands did you listen to in high school oh man uh a lot of not great ones um i was actually into like a rap phase in oh, high school nice. so a lot of kid cuddy j cole a lot of guys that don't really listen to anymore but uh reliant k is like the biggest oh, one out of all good. of them mm-hmm. yeah. matt teeson is just an mm-hmm. incredible lyricist mm-hmm. i'm still like oh wow that's actually really good and it's like songs i loved in middle school so yeah. I wasn't allowed to listen to bands in high school, not the non-Christian kind. Uh, so I have no idea. My I remember my dad like he saw me like looking up Christian artists or something like googling cuz I was like I would spend time looking for music yeah. and he's like, "You know, you don't have to only listen to Christian." And then my like, world exploded. <laughs> yeah. and I was like, "What?" <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. See in the car when we would drive around, it was like Roger Whittaker, John mm. Denver, and Murray and I was like, but that's what we had to listen to because it was my parents' choice. Yeah. Yeah. But Amy Grant and Michael W. Smith were huge in my high school oh. years. They like hit the big time. And to have like a Christian artist that was kind of known, that was kind of the start of Christian yeah. artists. Michael yeah, Michael Yeah, so I was allowed to go to those concerts <laughs> yeah, you were with my youth group. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's incredible. Yeah. The like early dub. Yeah. Like some. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like the Argyle sweater. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. I know. I don't think I've ever actually heard a song of his. I've just heard oh, people talk oh, yeah. about it. Mm-hmm. Like, so here's a. Uh, like friends are friends forever. My <laughs> sisters were big into the dub uh-huh. and big into Amy Grant. Uh, yeah. Connie Scott. Totally. Okay. So Sandy Con- Patty, here, ready for those? my Connie Scott story. Okay. So I'm at a, my, my wife, Sarah, her best friend growing up. Uh, she grew up in Tawasson, and so often in Christmas time, we go visit some of her friends in Tawasson and go mm-hmm. to some Christmas parties, that kind of stuff. Uh, it's always a really great time. And at one of the Christmas parties, Connie Scott was there. No way. Uh, How do they I, have that connection? And I see Connie Scott. And like I texted my sisters because I thought they're going to want to know that I'm at a party <laughs> with Connie yeah, Scott. Totally. So it turns out that Connie Scott is the aunt of, my, uh, of Sarah's best friend growing wow. up. And uh-huh. so uh, I wasn't a, 
like a huge Connie Scott fan, but I remember my sisters had had her albums, and so I was uh-huh. texting them most of the party after the like initial stage of like "Hello, nice to see you" stage, where I'm now Sarah's mingling and yeah. I'm in the corner somewhere talking <laughs> with one of the other husbands who married into the scene, uh-huh. and yes. I'm just texting about Connie Scott, and totally. doing Connie Scott lyrics. Yeah. So that's cool. my uh, claim to Connie claim Scott to fame. fame. Mm-hmm. Nice. Just so, yeah, write that as far as it'll take you, man. <laughs> you, yeah. <laughs> Which I didn't expect to bring it up here. Yeah. But. <laughs> Look at that. But the Surprise. link between Amy Grant to Connie Scott, that's a strong link. It's a strong mm. link. Mm. Yeah. Probably one to one, people who <laughs> like Amy Grant also liked Connie Scott. Well, there was a bunch that followed after Amy Grant, like Twyla Paris and a few of those. Twyla Paris. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. My husband Mark was really into like Petra and White Heart and went to yes. all those. Yeah. Good times. I know. I told him that Jonathan was into Petra and he's like, oh, I could go to a concert with Jonathan. <laughs> totally. <laughs> I've been to events with Jonathan, and it's underwhelming. What? Like going That's to things Jonathan. with Jonathan. Jonathan yeah. is underwhelming. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. That doesn't make sense. No, it does. Shots fired. Shots yeah, fired. Exactly. <laughs> you can bring him back. He'll yeah. tell you how underwhelming it is to be around me. He's like, yeah, it's actually not that great. You guys go real low key when you're like outside of the office? Is that what it is? Like comatose? Like yeah. What? Yeah. So John and I, we've had a friendship for a long time. I always joke that like the first time that we ever really became friends, we were on a, I think we were eight on a soccer team together. Okay. His dad was the coach. So Jonathan played and I mostly watched our team play. I was nice. on the bench a lot, yeah. a lot. It's my athletic history <laughs> mm. is actually being on the bench. Yeah. Um, and so we did that and then uh, kind of crossed paths again in high school. Um, and so him and I, we have a long enough history together that we can – kind of pick up conversations about anything from sports to stuff going on at work to stuff in family to marriage, whatever. We can kind of pick up and drop conversations all Mm -hmm. over the place and kind of weave them together. So, And then sometimes just not talk hardly at all if we're together. Um, And so that's usually my preference is to (laughs) not talk with him. But uh, but yeah, it's... Let the wives talk, hang out. Totally. Yeah, it's actually been cool to see. So the first time uh, Jonathan and and, uh, Brianna, his wife... They were uh, dating and stuff. We decide as as couples to kind of all go to Seattle for a weekend, and we are dating, so we like divided and conquered mm-hmm. the room, like gender appropriate, right? Yep. And uh, we we realized that like our wives had never met, and the first thing, <laughs> or our girlfriends at the time had never met, and the first thing we do is like, let's go to Seattle. We're gonna go to a Seahawks game. We're gonna go spend a day. We'll go to the game. You girls can go shopping. They had never met before. And I remember we were like, this is just like, we're just throwing it in the fire, right? And if it Mm -hmm. comes out pure gold, amazing. If it burns up because it was just chaff, well, now we know, right? Now we know that our friendship is just a us thing. And actually, since then, they've become really close friends Mm -hmm. too. So it's a lot of fun having all of us. Yeah, We all have kids around the same ages Mm -hmm. and get to hang out a lot. So it's it's good. That went about as good as it possibly could. Totally. It could have <laughs> yeah. gone so much worse. <laughs> totally. Like so much worse. So tell us about your early years. Where did you grow up? Tell us about your family, stuff like that. Yeah, I grew up Abbotsford. Uh, my dad was a pastor at Seven Oaks Alliance Church as a music pastor when we first moved to Abbotsford. I was six months old when we first moved out here uh, from Richmond. And uh, dad was a music pastor at Seven Oaks for a few years, and then he got a job as a music pastor at Bakerview hmm. for another, call it six, I don't know, seven, eight years, something like that. Uh, during that time, um, we as a family went to Bakerview because uh, he was a pastor there. And then dad took a break. Um, mom, mom's been a teacher in the school district and then uh, Abbotsford School District, and then more recently now at MEI these past I don't know, almost a decade probably or so. Um, he left Bakerview when I would have been like 11 years old okay. uh, to pursue a doctorate in voice performance, actually. Oh, interesting. So I always joke that he's like a doctor of singing. Yeah. Um, what does that entail, a I, yeah. doctorate of voice performance? Well, it's like a doctor of fine arts, right? Okay. And the fine art that he specified, he uh, particularized in was a vocal performance. So he's... Uh, He went, I remember he uh, shaved off his goatee, which was like big for our family. Uh, And he like toured in a opera in Europe. Interesting. And so we have these pictures of my dad in like opera with like the white face paint and the whole thing. And um, so like I have very kind of fuzzy memories about that. I just remember him like leaving Uh for Europe to sing. And I was like, okay. 
have fun. <laughs> and then he came back without a goatee, and we were like, this can't happen. You have to grow that back immediately. Nice. Um, so then he got his doctorate, and uh, after he finished that, Bakerview asked him to come back in a role of kind of like a senior associate, community care, teaching, discipleship kind of a thing. Uh, when he left Bakerview the first time, we actually all as a family went to Northview. Hmm. And so hmm. from grade six, I, I had connections at Northview because uh, the grade, the middle school ministry at the time had a thing called Gym Jam okay. for <laughs> middle schoolers. And it was basically just like an after school okay. playing in the bubble um, nice. kind of stuff. Or at the gym at that time? I forget. Maybe it would have been Center Court. Somewhere. Which is, yeah, was Center the Court gym, probably. I think, before yeah. it was Center Court. Yep. That was it. Uh, so then when, uh, dad got the call back to Bakerview, uh, I already had relationships and friendships here. By that point, I was probably in grade nine or 10. And so some of you who are long-term Northview people, you could probably find like a yearbook, a Northview yearbook from like, let's call it 2004, maybe of, if you look in the H section, there's Harris, there's Greg. Grade 10 Greg. Really? By the, yourself? In the North View yearbook by, by myself. So you have Just older me. siblings, though. Two older sisters. Okay. So Lyra is about seven years older than me. Amy is four years older than me. Okay. Um, and they went back to years, Bakerview? Four years, I think. They went back to Bakerview. Okay. Uh, actually, no. Lyra stayed for a while because Lyra worked as a Johnny Markins admin assistant oh. for hmm. a bunch of years. Um, and then she left and Kim, Kim Campbell okay. came in to take her job. Uh, around the same time that Jeff came on board. So okay. I think Lear and Jeff worked together for like a week. And then Lear was like, that's okay. it. I'm getting out of here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I can't be around this guy. That Jeff guy. <laughs> Even though he was in Young Outs and she had nothing to do with him. Yeah. <laughs> it was, uh, she saw the writing on the wall. Right. <laughs> Got out of there. Um, yeah, Lyra is married uh, and two kids. And uh, her husband's a realtor in town. And um, her kids are at MEI. Amy is married, three kids, and husband is a berry farmer mm-hmm. in town. Um, so yeah, that's I'm the youngest, which probably Baby explains a, a lot. lot. Of things, mm-hmm. yeah. I'm actually the youngest of the Harris side. So my dad was the youngest of seven kids and a uh, lot of cousins on that side. Mm. Um, let's call it, let's say it's like, I don't know, ballpark 30 something mm-hmm. with married ins and stuff. And mm-hmm. I, uh, I, I have a cousin who is like the same age or close to the same age as my parents yeah. is kind of the, mm. the yeah. distance of heart, right? So yeah. my dad, the youngest of seven, I'm the youngest cousin of yeah. them all, and then I'm the youngest of my family. So for those of you who are really into birth order, you're like, <laughs> no, oh, like, that explains so much yeah. about who you are why and you why you act. Why you Skippy when you are first here. Totally, <laughs> why you yeah. act the way you do. <laughs> why you need a beard. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. to show that I can grow one. <laughs> <laughs> show yeah. some age. Totally. My. It's funny, the beard is funny because... Sarah doesn't like the beard. Not mm. a big beard fan. She puts up with the beard because she knows it helps my ministry because mm-hmm. it makes me look not like a baby face. My dad has a totally. baby face. If my dad shaves, yeah. he looks like he's 12. Yeah. Uh, and if I shave, I have a baby face as well. And it, does, it doesn't help to look like a baby <laughs> when you're in pastoral ministry. You're trying to be a campus ministry. pastor, which we'll get totally. to in a bit. But yeah, you need the reputation of the beard. Exactly. Plus, there's a lot of beards at East Abbey. Yeah. There's true. some beards. Yeah. Yeah. There's big beards at East Abbey, yeah. not just regular beards. You like can have a beard competition ones. over there, yeah. Greg. Yeah. I don't know how... That would be a really slow competition. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the ones who already have the big beards, you right. could just line them up and right. say, look that's, at this. That's beards. how you keep people involved long term. Totally. Like exactly. Totally. <laughs> we'll, we'll grade it in 2021. Yeah. That's when we'll evaluate. <laughs> so in high school, what yes. would you have said that you would have been for a profession? So actually, when I was in grade 10, uh, I... I Try to convince my uh, my career and what do we call that class? Life life planning or career counseling or something. I forget yeah. what it was called. Something like that. Planning ten or planning something. planning ten. Sure, yeah. sounds like. I think that's what, what it would it be was. called. Yeah. So my planning ten teacher, I I try to convince her that I wanted to be like a stand up comic and like improv actor <laughs> and these kinds of things. <laughs> really? Like I thought that would be that's fun. Amazing. To be have fun. like my life basically be writing jokes and and doing improv and making people laugh. Like you do at the staff soiree. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We have uh, this thing once a year where we roast the staff and Greg's the host. So you get yeah. to do that then. I've retired from that though. Oh, Breaking really? news. Yeah, I've oh. handed off the reins. So I won't say uh, to who uh, because uh, the uh, staff, uh, it's a surprise and the people who are listening to this don't care. Yeah, it's true. But <laughs> okay, I'll be involved a bit behind the scenes in, in writing the staff soiree. Um, 
I, I tried to convince her that that would be a good career path for me, and she said that I would be terrible at it. Oh. And so I stopped. I was like, okay, that's enough. Like, one person <laughs> told me no, and you know these <laughs> stories of people who, like, fight through adversity? Yeah. That's not my thing. I'm yeah. like, eh, one nice. person said no, so I yeah. guess I won't do that. Mm-hmm. You're uh, right. It's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay, I won't do that anymore. Yeah. Uh, and then it went into sports broadcasting journalism was the actual plan. So grade 11, grade 12, that was what I was working towards, right? Because everyone asks you in grade 12, what are you going to do with your life? And what are you going to school for? The answer was always uh, communications, broadcast journalism, that kind of and thing. And look, he's on the podcast, Josh. Yeah. So I've Amazing. lived the dream. You live Bro- the dream. You're broadcasting. Yeah. I'm currently broadcasting. <laughs> so what did you do for school then? Well, I was enrolled in the communications program at UFE. So my plan was to get a communications BA and then to... Uh, to apply, you could audition and apply for certain broadcasting schools throughout Canada. Um, you would do kind of like audition and they would test the talent kind of thing. And if mm-hmm. you made the cut, one of the few people who made the cut, you would get kind of like your uh, broadcasting certificate paid for by these institutions. So my plan was get a communications degree. At least mm-hmm. I can get the like writing side down well. And then if I have like an on air piece in the future, that'd be fun too. Uh, Mm -hmm. So I was enrolled at UFE for communications. And in like August, August, I think, July, maybe late July, I decided to not go to UFE and to do one year at CBC. Okay. So I thought I'm going to do one year of Bible school because I thought, you know what? Broadcasting journalism could take me anywhere in Canada. Mm -hmm. And so I want to take a year to like invest in what I believe because I had a bit of a music background. I could play guitar a little bit. I could sing a little bit because dad doctored a voice, right? <laughs> yeah. Got a little bit of those genes. I thought whatever church I end up in, I can be like a volunteer worship guy. Okay. So why don't I do a year of just like rooting myself in my faith, what I believe, and then I'll go back to communications because whether I pursued journalism broadcasting at 22 or 23, what's the difference was okay. my thought. Uh, I remember my dad was away on a mission trip with Bakerview at the time that I made this decision. And uh, my mom, I think, essentially emailed him and was like, you're going to have to have a talk with your son because he's like changed his whole life plan from the past two years. Totally. To, he's not going to be a this. comedian anymore. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> totally. <laughs> you have to talk him out of this. Uh, so the plan was still broadcasting journalism, but just delay a year. Uh, and then I went to CBC. And actually halfway through my first year at CBC, through a connection of some friends, uh, I was brought on to Arnold Community Church to be their uh, worship leader, director guy. Uh, They were in the midst of a big renovation project. Mm -hmm. Um, They were renovating their their facility, their their church building down on in Arnold. And uh, they had to do their services on Sunday nights at Prairie Chapel. And part of this transition plan, they thought, why don't we bring in a worship director who even though we're going to have all of these different, like everything's changing kind of thing, we'll at least have one stable worship leader, like five out of six weeks, six out of seven weeks kind of okay. thing. So very, very much a part-time gig uh, working with the worship people. And I thought this is a great test to see if this is something I could do. So I entered CBC trying to get a one-year uh, certificate of worship arts because I thought if I go to a church somewhere in Toronto in the future, yeah. I could at least do like a worship arts volunteer kind of thing. So that job started up halfway through my first year, and they actually wanted to extend it through to make it kind of like 18 months, so Mm -hmm. through to the second year. So I thought, well, if if I've already committed to this 18-month job, why don't I go from like the one-year thing to a two-year thing in worship arts? So then I'll leave with this, and then I'll go to broadcasting journalism school. Uh, Long story short, I basically decided to just finish my degree because I had a little bit more credits than I needed for the two years. So I thought, let's just do four years. And uh, I really, I wanted to use my experience at Arnold to count retroactively for my internship credits. And it was just like a hard no from the faculty. They were like, that's not how the program works. And I was like, I'm the youngest child and I always get my way. (laughs) And so this needs to happen. And they were like, you can't actually bully us into this. (laughs) So I had to do another internship. Um, And that's when I I cold called actually Matt Schantz Hmm. at that time. I knew Matt from... Our days at back at Bakerview. Matt was at Bakerview when he was a teenager, and then I saw he was at Northview, and I was like, "Hey, I need to do an internship, and uh, I don't want to do music anymore because I don't like practicing, and I don't like playing, <laughs> and I don't so like arranging funny. music, and I don't like it at all anymore, <laughs> and I don't want to do this. Right. And so I, I'll do anything but music, basically. Okay. 
did you so experience at Arnold had something to do with you losing? No, my experience at Arnold was great. I just found the planning of songs and the practicing very monotonous. Just drained you. I just hated it. Hmm. I didn't think I would hate it. I yeah. thought I'd love it because yeah. I grew up at MEI. I did some worship leading and. At, at Northview, I did some worship leading as a volunteer sometimes, and I actually worked for a summer with Johnny Markinus, his worship, like, whatever, lackey. Worship boy. <laughs> worship boy, <laughs> where I just did some stuff, and and uh, I've, I've never, music has only ever been something that I've, like, been intuitively involved in. Like, I've never really been good at theory. I've never, mm. I didn't go far with piano. I gave up. It's too hard. <laughs> I, <laughs> uh, lots of things like that, and... I got to the point where I realized I, I don't I don't like I enjoy music but I don't like doing it all the time. Yeah. Mm. And uh, so I told Matt like I'll, like I'll do anything but music basically, and he said why don't you talk to a guy named Darcy, um, and because at that point Darcy was just creating the intern program along with Jeff. Okay. And uh, he said I think Darcy is probably looking for some help with some of his local mission stuff. So I said great I'll talk to Darcy about that. So I said hey I want to do an internship I don't need to be paid I don't care. I just have to get the credit for school. And he was like, okay, why don't you help me with some local mission stuff while I kind of develop the intern program along with Jeff. So I worked with Darcy the year before we launched the intern program. Okay. And then basically once I graduated from uh, college, so I, long story short, the year I graduated from college was the first year of the intern program here okay. at Northview, and mm -hmm. then also my first year being on staff at Northview. Okay. So Darcy basically made a play with the elders and senior leadership team that if he was going to oversee the intern program, then he needed someone to help him with the local mission side, because mm -hmm. Darcy was at that time the missions pastor overseeing mm -hmm. global and local. And uh, because I was the intern doing it, uh, I stepped into that role. So I was served, started working at Northview full time as a local missions director in 2010. Oh, okay. So, so you went into CBC going, this is just going to be one year. Yeah. And then you're like, wow, well, I might as well <laughs> do <laughs> two years. Two years. Oh, I might as well do four years. Yeah. And so, did you, by the end of the four years, kind of realize that maybe being in a church was a thing? Or you, were you in denial like the whole way through? So, I would say that. I wasn't planning on doing broadcasting anymore once I got to about year three. Mm -hmm. uh, by that point, I thought my brother-in-law was in real estate um, and my other brother-in-law was in farming. I tried the farming thing and he would be the first to tell you I was terrible at it. I have friends who are farmers and they would also tell you I'm just, I'm not, I, I'm not for that world. <laughs> um, so there's all kinds of deficiencies I have that make farming not for me. Uh, and so... I thought, why don't I do real estate with my brother-in-law at some mm. point? So I, I came into doing the local mission director thing because I thought it's a job staring me in my face. Mm -hmm. And I love Northview mm. and local missions is important. And I can do this for probably, I don't know, two years. Mm. And then I'll be a real estate agent or something like that. I'll pursue something else, not broadcasting. By that point, I was uh, Sarah and I were engaged pretty much, I think. We were married in 2011. So I think we were engaged by the point I started working here full time. Um, and so I was like, you know what? I'm not going to start a whole new career trajectory that needs years and years of schooling. Hmm. Um, I'll do real estate, make it a bucket of money, mm -hmm. give a bucket of money away. I don't know. Live on Eagle Mountain. Yeah. I'll do that at some point. <laughs> That's yeah. the dream. Um, I would say the transition point in my mind going from, again, to real estate, make a lot of money, give some away and all that kind of stuff to, to being in pastoral ministry long term happened once I started... Um, doing a little bit of classroom teaching. So mm. I, along with Darcy, we decided at, at the time around 20, it was probably around 2011, 2010, we decided to cancel the Alpha program, which had been a long-standing ministry of mm -hmm. Northview mm -hmm. um, and had massive success for yeah. so many years. And so I ran that program for a few years with Dave Heidebrecht and some other people. Um, in, in the place of doing the Alpha program, we decided to develop some like how to have gospel conversations with others yeah. kind of material. So I worked on doing a lot of reading, research, paper writing, that kind of stuff to talk through what it would be like to have this gospel conversations kind of course slash booklet kind of thing. Um, it was actually in the midst of preparing that curriculum, writing the curriculum, and then teaching the curriculum that I was like, 
I think this is what I should do. Mm -hmm. Like I think teaching and preaching and communicating is what I should be doing. So I think looking back, the goal was to be involved in communications, to be involved in writing and speaking about what I loved the most, which was sports. Mm. Like if you interview Greg, grade 11 Greg had like all the Canucks stuff, all the Canucks jerseys. I watched every single game all the way through, wouldn't miss anything, all the way basically up until they lost the cup in 2011. Like I was a diehard Canucks Mm. fan. Like I, I know things about the late 90s, early 2000s NHL statistics that like I wish I could fill those memories with something yeah. more valuable <laughs> than like Jason Arnott wearing number 44 for the Edmonton Oilers in the late 90s. That doesn't help me anymore in anything, but I can't get it out of my head. We all have those. Right? Like and if so, I could just delete some things, old phone numbers and totally. stuff, I would have more space. Yeah, Kelly Bookberger, number 16. I know so much about the Edmonton Oilers in the late 90s that I have no purpose for that. Hey, did you know that Trevor Lindon and I have the same birthday the Shut same year? Up. Yeah, I wow. sent him a birthday card one year because I wanted free tickets and didn't get them. Oh, no. So then so I stopped following him. Trevor Lindon was like the reason I lived I know. for so many of yeah. my years. Like when he got traded, like I was crushed. I know, it was a big deal. And then I remember the day, so my, my parents got a, a new big screen TV, one of those like big ones that is actually, I think the size of the room we're recording mm-hmm. it right now, yeah. right? Like just massive back yeah. of these things. And the day we installed it, we got the news on Sportsnet that Trevor Linden was traded back to Vancouver. Ooh, and I thought good. this was a joke. <laughs> like we have a big screen TV yeah. and now Linden's coming back. It was a, it was a good day. <laughs> so sports were like, in particular, following hockey and the NFL were like the th- the thing that gave me life and joy. Um, I'd, I'd always been interested in sports. I played them growing up. By about grade 10, a mix of me not growing any taller and me having lots of ankle injuries and mm. being the slowest guy on the team and also one of the shortest made me decide, you know what, maybe I'll just not do basketball mm. anymore <laughs> because not. I'm being tired of being yeah. the 12th man, never playing. That sucks. And I thought, I can sing, I'll do choir. And there's girls in choir. Yeah. <laughs> True. And so I did it. True. Um, but yeah, looking back on it, what I wanted to do is talk about sports because sports was the reason why I wanted to do anything. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's funny now looking back that I'm basically doing similar things. I'm writing, I'm speaking, I'm communicating, I'm mm-hmm. doing that kind of stuff. But now it's about something that I actually like more than sports. It's about the gospel. It's about yeah. um, good mm-hmm. news. It's about life transformation. It's about all of that. So- and so... So walk us through this church multiplication thing. I know you wanted to be a church planter back. Tell us a little bit of the story of that. Yeah. So I would say, I don't know if I had a burning desire to be a church planter, but so much of my journey has been falling into things, like not planning it, even though I'm a massive planner and I'm like anxious about my planning. um, And that's been, the Lord has been working, chiseling that part of me away. Uh, mostly through my kids, because yeah. I'm like, oh, I can't plan anything. Nothing right. in my life I can mm-hmm. control. Um, I learned that with Ben, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I was, I wanted to see if church planting was something that they would say I would be good at, um, because I didn't know what I should. Do. I knew I didn't want to pursue real estate or broadcasting anymore. I knew I wanted to be in pastoral ministry, but then I was thinking, what does that mean? Like, what am I going to do realistically moving forward? Um, so I did the church planner assessment. Um, and they gave me like, I think it's called a conditional pass. Basically they said, you, like, you could probably be involved in church planting as long as you had a team around you that was so skilled and (laughs) had such a wide range of abilities that you really didn't have to do everything. Did they really say that to you? Yeah. So the the conditional approval of church planting was you have to go in with a team Interesting. because your skill set is strong but limited hmm. in terms of... More specific. You're or more of a specialist in terms of some of the leadership, teaching, that yeah. kind of stuff. Hmm. So I would say actually leadership has, has been one of those things that throughout my, um, even from like grade seven on, I kind of always found myself in different leadership capacities through high school. I was you know student council president and did some other leadership, which by the way, I thought would have more cred once you're done high school, that it does. <laughs> no. It has zero. No, it does not matter. Like, it means nothing. And I like remember... Like valedictorian. Yeah. Like, at least that, I feel like people are like, oh, so you were smart. Student council president is, like, it, actually a useless thing to pursue. So if you're listening to this, don't do it. Because <laughs> it gives you nothing. If you're in it, I'm sure it'll come to yeah. some use somewhere. No, it won't. It, but it's okay. It's a good experience. Um, so, yeah, I think the leadership and the teaching bit have been kind of the 
the gift set that I've been given. And so trying to make best use of that while building a team around me that can have other strengths. Mm -hmm. Um, And so once I got that from the uh, church planting assessment people, uh, I kind of just thought, well, we'll see what happens. Uh, I didn't really have any plans on planting a church because it sounded like the way I would be involved in planting a church would have to be so specific that it almost seemed crazy to pursue it because how do you pursue something that specific yeah. in a way that's sustainable? Which is another thing we fell into because this time last year we were not considering East right. Abbey. Hmm. So walk us through what happened last year, last spring, a few weeks from now, kind of ish. Yeah. So um, basically the way the ball started rolling with East Abbotsford was we found out that there was, uh, you know, we'd already done Tri-City, we'd done Mission. We were starting to move more towards this thought of let's be more proactive rather than just reactive. We didn't know what that meant. No. Nope. Other than we said, let's be more proactive and yeah. Elder see said, what happens. okay, yeah. Right. Um, and then we found out that there had always been churches meeting at Abbotsford Christian School. Yeah. Uh, but for whatever reason, there was an empty, there was an opening. Actually, I think uh, Paul Seaman's daughter yeah. was in a prayer group at ACS. Yeah. And one of the people in her prayer group said, can you pray for our church? Because we just had our last Sunday. Yeah. And so Paul's daughter came to Paul and said, we prayed for this. And Paul was like, mm, interesting. So then he comes to, <laughs> yeah. to work the next day or a few days later and says, hey, there's no one meeting at ACS anymore. Yeah. And so Middle that's, school and high school gyms both had closed their which, churches. Which was the first time in like... Years, years mm-hmm. that these two gyms were open. So mm-hmm. the next, once we found out, uh, I was asked to call the ACS team because of part of my portfolio at the time was to help us think through some of this multiplication stuff. And uh, I called Julius, and uh, who's the executive director at ACS, Abster Christian School, and I said, hey, is it true that there's an opening? He said, yep. I said, do you have time to meet like tomorrow? He said, I actually do. He said, I just had a meeting cancel. And so let's meet. And he said, bring, I said, can I bring some people? And he said, yep, bring whoever you want. So Jeff, uh, Steve Weens, myself, and Lyndon Toftager went to Abbotsford Christian School in probably April of last year. A very end, like early May. Yeah, l- yeah end something of April, like right? that. Yeah. Wow. And uh, we looked at it and we were like, let's do it. Let, we don't know what that means, but let's pursue this. We have a lot of people living in East Abbotsford yeah. that go in Northview. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's still projected growth for East Abbotsford. Um, and so we thought this seems like the perfect opportunity to pursue something, right? It's close by, it's it's a rental, so it's not a lot of money up front in terms of a capital expense. And we were feeling really squished here at Downs Road, yep. thinking we need to have somewhere to put more people. Yep. And we have three services, which we want to move to two, so we're going to have to offload some people. Yep. And yep. hey, what an opportunity. Yeah. And so it kind of sat there for a few weeks of you know, we're going to do this and when's it going to happen and who's going to do it. And Sarah and I were talking and one of the things that m- moved us away from the church planting angle as a family was just the fact that my son has such complex medical and development needs. Uh, and we finally established a, a, root, a team around him that yeah. we liked. We mm-hmm. had a pediatrician we liked. We had a therapy team we liked. We had a trajectory of how we could see him do schooling and we kind of established enough roots here in Abbotsford that I was quite content to just do whatever role was needed to be done at Northview uh, for the foreseeable future, to, yeah. to be in ministry, to teach, to preach, to provide for my family, and to have a, a network of people around Ben without having to uproot our family to move somewhere and find a brand new team. Because mm-hmm. for our family to move, uh, you know, before we got married, Sarah and I said, like, we'll go anywhere and do yeah. anything. If God calls us to go to a different community, a different country, we will. Um and so to be kind of localized, to be forced to stay local because of some family dynamics was difficult yeah. for us, especially for Sarah, mm-hmm. uh, who has a real adventurous streak. Like she's hiked mm-hmm. the Himalayan mountains. She's done uh, all kinds of stuff. So yeah. for her to be landlocked in yeah. Abbotsford, of all places, was a challenge. Yeah. Um, and then when this East Abbotsford thing came up, I was like, you know what? This might be the thing. Like this might be the opportunity that... I was kind of built for yeah. this This going with a team, going with a, a support system that's big, going not on my own. Um, it's in Abbotsford, so I don't have to move my family. We don't have to uproot Ben from his team. Uh, so on the drive back 
from the Tri-City AGM. So Jeff, Steve Weens, and myself went to the Tri-City AGM to see how things were going. And I went because I was a frequent second preacher for Matt the mm-hmm. first year of Tri-City. So I was kind of like the Northview face. Yeah. Um, other than people knew Jeff as well, obviously. We're driving back from that AGM, uh, coming to a prayer meeting here for um, an East Abbotsford thing. And at that point, I'd been planning the prayer meetings just from like, a, I'm wearing a multiplication hat and we want to do this, but we don't know who's going to go, that kind of stuff. I remember just asking them on the way back, like, can I do it? Like, I think I want it. And the preceding like half an hour, 45 minute drive from Tri-City back to Downs Road was, I think, my interview <laughs> where they asked me a bunch of questions. Yeah. And uh, on the drive home, we built basically the team. Mm-hmm. I said, if I go, I'd like to go with Todd Wickens mm-hmm. uh, because he has a lot of connections with the Santa Court people. A lot of those people live in East Davidsford. And yep. I think Todd and I have a great relationship. Actually, a few years ago, mm-hmm. Todd and I laughed and dreamed about what would it be like to plant a church together. Really? So I was like, I want mm-hmm. Todd. Uh, I said, I want a strong female to help me on Sundays because of all kinds of reasons. So I said, I'd like Thalia to come. Uh, I said, I'd like Crystal LaForest to be the CM person. And we basically had a conversation in yeah. the car and they were like, okay, well, we'll like, we can't guarantee anything. We have to talk to these people, see what they think and talk to the other people involved. And we kind of, d- that was when we decided to do it and move forward. And so I remember going to that prayer meeting, leading it because I was leading multiplication stuff. And I didn't want to announce that I think I'm going to be the guy because that <laughs> yeah. felt like the wrong time. <laughs> yeah. uh, but we had some conversations with the elders and with uh, pastors and senior leadership team and all kinds of different iterations of conversations. And then at one pastor's meeting, it was kind of announced. And then we went forward and we built the team and went Vision meetings over summer and mm-hmm. met in center court, launched at ACS. It's been a bit of a blur, yeah, it's to been be a honest. Blur. It's, yeah. been, mm-hmm. it's been a very uh, stressful in a lot of ways yeah. season. Um, it's a lot of work. It's a this lot of work. church at a gym is like not for the faint of heart. Yeah, I was going to ask because like just hearing the story right now sounds like it's just like this bed of roses that you just like <laughs> turn over to one side and this new great it, it thing. It has you moments know. like that, <laughs> so, but yeah. there's thorns. Yeah, no, I <laughs> yeah. so want to know like the the struggles and hard parts of uh, that, that you've been going through. Yeah. Through so let me add a piece in there. Yeah. So when Greg came to talk to me about being part of this, Part of me was really excited because I live on that side of town and I know a lot of the people there. But part of me was like, ooh, we're leaving Saturday night because mm. we built up a community there and I'd been MC for a couple of years and that was a little hard to leave. I know it'd be very hard for my husband, Mark, but whoa, well, we got kind of excited. And so then for the next few months, it was very much a kind of a ripping, mm. kind of a grief, mm. a leaving Saturday night crew, the dinner and friends and the whole thing and moving over to like a Sunday time schedule, which oh. is... And actually a fairly lengthy time schedule on Sunday. So that was a bit hard, yeah. but is now so good. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I remember talking to Sarah too when we, cause I'd been at North U basically since I was 11 and by at North U, I mean like the Downs Road campus. Totally. So like, except for that year and a half, I was at Arnold as their worship leader for, since I've been 11, I've been coming to Downs mm-hmm. Road on a Sunday morning. Yeah. Uh, hmm. And so I remember one of the first things talking through Sarah was like, am I going to like hate it? Yeah. Like we're going to, it's going to be like December and it's going to be cold and yeah. rainy and I'm going to be driving to this place and I'm going to want, I'm going to have to, because of where I live, I have to drive past Downs Road campus yeah. every single time. And I thought, am I going to be like, what did I do? And she was like, well, I, we'll see what happens. Like, let's go forward. We think God's yeah. called us to this. It seems like it's the good opportunity to pursue. So, I mean, yeah, it's been, it's had its challenges, but at the same time, like I've told people, this isn't really a church plant. It is in some ways. It's a legitimate church plant in some yeah. ways, but the amount of support yeah. that Northview Community Church has been able to provide to get mm-hmm. this thing off the ground is not a typical church plant story. Well, a typical church plant brings like a few people over and then yeah. you have to try to find a few more people and you have to support the salary of the yeah. pastor from like 50 people if you're yeah. lucky. Mm-hmm. That's a typical story. Whereas we brought over, we thought we would have like what, 300 I in thought September, we would be. October. I thought we would have probably about 200 people from North U come, and then probably about 100 people from elsewhere come. Yeah, and we thought they would boomerang back yeah. to Downs Road. Yeah. That we would sort of maintain ourselves if we were lucky at maybe 300. Yeah, I thought we'd probably our first service would be mm-hmm. about 450, 500 people with kids, and then we'd boomerang down to like a 250 to three by the time November hit. And now we are at. Yeah, we our launch Sunday was 720 people. 
And then between our launch Sunday, which was Thanksgiving in October, until uh, basically now, we've been our average has been 650 with about mm. 150 kids included. So it's well and truly double what yeah. we expected all across the board from Absolutely. total attendance to CM, um, which has brought some great momentum, some other challenges and stuff. But the the reality of the team that's been able to pull this off, of us relying on our tech team to give us so much support and get the thing off the ground. Um, and to, the amount of volunteers that have bought right. in, that are there mm. from 6 a.m. till yeah. we close at 1.30 and everywhere in between. Yep. Like we said, we need more volunteers. People put up their hands. They show up early yep. in the morning, they stay late, mm-hmm. they do all kind. We take 130 volunteers-ish yep. on a Sunday to yep. get the thing started and closed up. Yeah. Which, and what's, like, percentage-wise, I feel like, just for the people who attend the church yeah. is crazy. Yeah. yeah. It is. It's a it's a huge... Because well, it's 130 per Sunday, but we have now, in most places, four teams. Hmm. Yeah. And so I remember when we were doing the, the, you know, the vision casting over the summer months, kind of May, June, July, August, we... Uh, like we were banging the drum of like you have to help. Yeah. Like <laughs> yeah, if you don't if you don't that. help it yeah. won't happen. Yeah. Seriously, if you don't help it's not going to it won't get yeah. off the ground. I know. Yeah. And then we'll say wasn't that embarrassing? Yeah. Totally. <laughs> because it just it won't actually happen if you yeah. don't step in and people stepped up. And what's crazy to me also is that we have like almost zero parking I know. at ACS and mm. we have so many people take a bus. Yeah. yeah. Every week from Bateman. And kids like it. I know. And kids are making their parents take the bus I and know. it's and people are walking and biking and parking partway up the hill, totally. and it's amazing. So it's gone really well. And mm-hmm. I think what I'm excited about now moving forward is I don't totally care about the numbers. I think the numbers are an indication of how things are going, but I don't think they tell the whole story. What I'm what I'm hopeful for is that the people who are committed to East Abbotsford campus long term see it as a place where they're going to grow roots deep where they're going to grow with other people to look more like Jesus in carrying each other's burdens and rejoicing with those who rejoice and and helping people raise their kids and mm-hmm. having com- and grieving with people when they lose mm-hmm. loved ones and when they walk through the valley moments and I'm also really excited about the fact that we have so many people who have neighbors and mm-hmm. colleagues and family members who don't know Jesus that now there's another place for them to invite their family to say why don't you come and have have a cup of coffee, have a baked good, and here's some really good news yeah. for people who have no hope, for people who live with crippling loneliness, yeah. for people who feel like there's no purpose, yeah. to be able to hear the good news of who Jesus is and what he's done. I've said from day one that my goal with this campus has not been simply to create a capacity at the Downs Road campus. No. Like the goal wasn't, let's just alleviate some seats, and then the Downs Road thing can keep going. My goal from day one. That was necessary, but not our primary goal. It was a major reason for why the East Abbotsford thing made sense to do, is because we needed to help create capacity. Yeah. But that's a really short vision Mm -hmm. that lasts only months to create space at Downs Road Campus. And that's not why the church doesn't exist just to make seats available at other churches, (laughs) right? So I wanted our goal from day one to be, let's, let's be serving each other, let's be self-sacrificial and taking yeah. a shuttle instead of parking at the church yeah. so that people who don't know Jesus yet can hear about Jesus. Yeah. I'm actually increasingly convinced that the whole re- the whole purpose of of why we exist as Christians is to grow ourselves as followers of Jesus and to also help people who don't follow him yet. Yeah. Start. Yeah. And it's a little easier to do that to walk alongside others when you're serving together. Totally. Because mm-hmm. you're picking up chairs and you're vacuuming carpets together and you can have those little conversations. Yeah. Like that time factor is a big deal because yeah. we have to be there a long time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's great. Yeah. So if you haven't been and you want to, we uh, now just this last week, we moved into the high school gym and uh, that takes more work yep. than even the middle school gym did. I went home yeah. this last Sunday after it and I was like, okay, so I thought it was a lot of work before and now it feels like double yeah. every Sunday. Yeah, uh, so we but, need more hands. But we need more hands. But plug in if you live on that side of town, and especially if you live on that side of town, you can live wherever and come. But especially if you live in East Abbotsford, come try it out. Mm-hmm. And if you stick around for a few weeks, I'll tell you, you have to park at Bateman now and <laughs> yeah. take the shuttle and I need you to serve somewhere. Totally. But the reason we're doing it is to help make Jesus famous to people yeah. who don't know him yet and help all of us look more like him in our everyday life. Absolutely. 
Those are good last words from Greg. Yeah. yeah. Phenomenal. Thanks for joining us, Greg. My pleasure. <laughs>